Hello. Today we're beginning Grade 8, Unit 1, Session 1 in your Sophia book. So on the computer, you'd be going into the first section, and you'll see Step 1 and Step 2 at the top of your screen after you click on Unit 1, Session 1. In your book, um, you'd be on page 3 to begin with. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I just want to explain these videos. I'm just helping. I want to be able to give you the answers to your book and also um, help you with any other questions you might have. You, you can feel free to have your parents email me a question, or um, I think there's a, there's a feature where you can send a question directly to the teacher. But if not, feel free to have your parents send the question to me and I will discuss it on the next video. So what I'd like you to do right now is, is to read this article on the church. It's page three and the top of page four in your workbook. And here you see it on the computer screen. Then pause the video and answer the questions. And then um, you'll go to step two to get the questions. So now, now I'm going to answer the questions with the hope that you've already answered them either in your book or on the computer. So question number one, what does the word ecclesia mean? Church. It's the Latin from the Latin. What does the Greek word ecclesia mean? Church. Um, it, it has a connotation of calling forth, like calling a group of people together, ecclesia. What did the earliest Christians call themselves and why? They called themselves the church. We know that um, it says in the Acts of the Apostles that it was in Antioch that they were first called Christians. But as a whole, they regarded themselves as, as the people of God who had been called together into a community. What is the Sept Septuagint? The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was made about, um, it gives you the exact year, um, 132 BC, meaning so 132 years before Christ, this book was trans, the Old Testament, whose books were originally written in Hebrew, or some in Aramaic, um, were, was translated into Greek by this group of, um, it was called the Septuagint because it was 70 scholars. 70 Hebrew scholars who translated it. And that would, it's significant to Jesus because that was the most common translation available to them. So that would have been the, the translation that he would have been quoting from, that um, his teachings are, um, you can trace his teachings particularly to that translation. What does the Hebrew word kahal mean? How is the word translated into the Greek Septuagint and who was it used to describe? Okay, it means assembly or congregation. And um, it was translated into the Greek as ecclesia. So it means like, again, the same meaning, the calling forth together. What did the earliest Christians understand themselves to be when they called themselves the church? God's chosen people. Okay, so we know from the Old Testament that the chosen people were the people descended from Abraham, that God had called and promised um, that he would bless all the nations through de the descendants of Abraham, who were the Jewish people, the 12 tribes of Israel descend from Abraham. And so the church has inherited that blessing of God, the calling forth of the people, even though we're not Jewish, most of us are not Jewish by race, but um, you could say in a certain sense, we are Jewish by heritage. What did Jesus what did Jesus tell Peter he would build upon him? And what word did Jesus use for this? It's in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus says, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we have that promise of Jesus Christ that, in fact, he's the one who gave Peter his name. His name was Simon before Jesus met him and called him and named him Caiaphas, which um, has come to us as Peter. And so the rock, the rock on which um, Jesus will build his church. 
and we know that um, that was after Jesus had professed his face when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Jesus said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So that the Peter was the first Pope of the Catholic church. And now since Peter, there's been a Pope leading the church as the vicar of Christ down through all those centuries. I think Pope Francis is uh, um, about the 264th Pope. So um, those are the, oh wait, I didn't finish all these questions, there's one more. What did Jesus establish during his life, his earthly life? He established the kingdom of God. Okay, that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that God is the, our source and summit, which we celebrate in the liturgy, that we come from God and we're going to God. So things had gotten out of order ever since Adam and Eve committed the original sin in the human race. Jesus came to reestablish the proper order of the kingdom of God and to call us into that heavenly kingdom. But the church on earth is, um, Jesus established the church. And that's one thing you can easily prove from history that the Catholic church is the church that Jesus Christ established. And what makes it difficult um, for people sometimes to, to believe in the Catholic church is because of the fact that we're, the church is made up of sinners. That the church is, um, we all of us are sinners, but the church is holy because of Jesus Christ. And um, that's, I wanna to mention to you as it, it did tell you in the very first essay in, the, in your workbook, which you, I would recommend that you read, it's on page one. Um, that the church has four marks by which we distinguish the Catholic Church from every other church. And those four marks are one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. So, so if you, um, I, let me just briefly explain those four marks of the Catholic Church. One, okay, that even though the church is throughout, in countries throughout the world speaking many different languages, there's only one um, baptism one Lord, one faith, one God and Father of all, as, as St. Paul tells us. Holy, the church is holy because it's the body of Christ and its founder and its head is holy, Jesus Christ. Catholic means universe, universal, it, it's welcoming all people. There's nobody who is excluded from the invitation to join the Catholic church. It's meant to be the sacrament of salvation for the whole human race. And apostolic, it traces its roots back to Jesus and the 12 apostles. So if you would now go on to, um, you, you can go back to the home screen and um, at the home screen, you'll see an option to go on to the next um, part, which is priest, prophet, and king. So these are the three roles of Jesus Christ, um, priest, prophet, and king. And these three roles are um, now continued by the Catholic Church on earth as, as, a, as a communion of, of all the faithful, but also as individuals, because when we were baptized, we were baptized into the body of Christ. So we also, by our baptism, became priest, prophet, and king. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But if you could read this, this section on... Jesus Christ, Priest, Prophet, and King. This is on page five and six in your workbook, or it's here on the computer screen. Then pause the video and answer the questions, and then I'm going to go over the answers with you. So when you've done that, click on step two to get the questions. So the first question, well, um, the, the, the computer screen doesn't exactly match um, the book. so. What I'm going to do is read to you, um, I'm gonna read the book answers and then, um, then we'll do the fill in the blank for the, from the computer screen. What three roles did God give to Adam in the beginning? Priest, prophet, and king. What is the most important job of a priest? Right, the priest is the mediator between God and humanity. He, he brings the offering of the people, the sacrifice of the people to God, and he brings the word of God to the people. What was this meant to do? Okay, so it was meant to be a mediation between, between God and man. In fact, um, the word pontiff, if you study its original roots, like we call the Pope the pontiff, um, has the meaning of bridge. So, so like a bridge between heaven and earth. 
and we know Jesus is the high priest. What is the most, what does a prophet do? A prophet speaks God's word to the people. So sometimes um, we know that prophets have not always, many times prophets are rejected because, for example, in our own time, um, people who people who preach the truth about life, that life begins at conception and ends only with natural death, or people who say that, um, who teach the truth that marriage is between one man and one woman. Uh, that's, that's a prophetic teaching. It comes from the law of God. It means the revealed word of God. But the people who convey that are very often persecuted because Jesus himself was crucified, we know, and he is the truth. So it's something that we need to receive without anger and hatred because the early Christians converted so many people of the Roman Empire to Christianity by loving their enemies. So, so Christianity has this like paradoxical power, which is when Jesus said, love your enemies, that it's true that the truth is going to be persecuted. But it's also true that if you respond with love, the truth spreads. Because um, that's just the way love works, that um, love is a power that, that hatred can't overcome. And um, so we see so many Christians who laid down their lives as martyrs for the truth of Jesus Christ. The church is um, built on the blood of Christ and the blood of many, many martyrs. Who, who also have laid down their lives in witness to that truth. What does it mean for a king to have dominion and to govern? So a king is in the role of a father of a family over his kingdom, that he is to, is to direct the family to, the, to its ultimate good. So, so a king, a good king, should be directing his people to the kingdom of heaven, to, the, to everlasting life with God because that's the only kingdom that will that is without end the kingdom of god the kingdom of jesus christ when jesus said i am the way and the truth and the life what can we understand him to be saying well there's there's a little chart in your book in your workbook on page five that very well answers this question the way jesus said i am the way the truth and the life so the way is his role as king and lawgiver the truth prophet he speaks he is the word of God. And St. Thomas Aquinas, or maybe it was St. John of the Cross, one of the saints said, Jesus is the fullness of revelation. And it's also the teaching of the Second Vatican Council that there's nothing more that God can say that he hasn't already spoken in Jesus Christ, the fullness of the truth. And the life, um, because he is our high priest, and it's by his offering on the cross that he, he, died, he willingly laid down his life, died on the cross and rose from the dead so that we could live forever. So I'm um, now going to your word bank. Oh, wait, I, I didn't finish these other questions yet, did I? Sorry. Um, question number six in the workbook. What role of Adam does Jesus claim when he says that he is the way? That would be a king. And how does he fulfill this role? Because he established the kingdom of God, the right ordering of human relationships. Like when he, when he was asked, um, what is the great commandment in the law? He said, the greatest commandment in, in the law is you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. So, so he put back into right order the relationship between God and humanity, which is what the kingdom of heaven's purpose is. What role of Adam does Jesus claim when he says that he is the truth? the prophet, and how does he fulfill that rule? Um, because by communicating himself to us, um, both, both through his spoken word and through his precious body, blood, soul, and divinity, where we receive the fullness of, of Jesus Christ into our own bodies in Holy Communion. Remembering that Jesus is the fullness of revelation and remembering that when he comes to us in Holy Communion, he comes with a message for us for that day. So many people, I think, um, you know, they just receive Holy Communion and then they, they act as if they have done, you know, nothing. Like as if, uh, as if communion was just bread rather than the living God. Okay, so what we need to do is 
we need to go back to our place and close our eyes and um, open our hearts because the word of God is physically present in our bodies at that moment. And he's communicating, he wants to communicate his love in a very specific way. Like there's something specific to that day that he wants to tell you about. And so you need to be aware. Like Jesus said to St. Margaret Mary, will you be my friend? And, and that's kind of astonishing to think that the King of Kings and the Lord of Glory would ask that of a human person, will you be my friend? But he longs for that relationship. He, he doesn't want us to ignore him and treat him as if he were just an object. So let's pray that we can have that deep understanding of the gift of the Holy Eucharist. What role of Adam? Oh, okay, we did, I did answer question number eight. So now let's look at the um, questions here on the computer screen. A priest offers sacrifice to God for the people. A prophet speaks on God's behalf. A king governs by creating and enforcing laws and judging his subjects. Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments by teaching that we must love God above all else and our neighbor as ourselves. The Beatitudes deepen the meaning of the Ten Commandments. And I would recommend you reading the, the, the eight Beatitudes. You can find them in, in your New Testament in the Gospel of St. Matthew, Chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus begins Chapter 5 by giving us the eight Beatitudes. Now, if you would go back to the home screen again, okay, and back again to Unit 1. Okay, now we're going on to Liturgy, Doctrine, and Hierarchy. Okay, so these are liturgy doctrine and hierarchy are, are three roles that the church on earth plays that reflect Jesus way, truth, life, prophet, priest, and king. So see, there's, there's parallels that are occurring here. So if you would um, answer the questions either on page eight and nine of your book, or um, on the, if you would pause the video and answer the questions, then we'll come back and explain them. Okay, so then if you, um, if you click on, okay, I think I, I have to go back to, um, let me answer the book questions first, okay, because I think it'll be easier. Actually, I think they're the same, so I'll answer the questions from the book, and then you can um, check them along with your computer screen. Okay, so it's page eight in the book. And so it's either, um, now for some of these, there's actually an overlap. So I would consider that there's more than one right answer for some of these because I, there is an overlap. The apostles ordained bishops as their successors to preserve their teaching authority and to keep whole and alive all that was given to them. That's hierarchy. And see, only a bishop has the power to ordain another bishop. And only a bishop has the power to ordain other priests. But the apostles... Um, ordained bishops and then they ordained bishops and that chain has never been broken all the way down to our present bishops it's called apostolic succession number two during the roman persecutions many people publicly renounced their faith in jesus in order to avoid being killed by the romans when the per persecutions ended many wanted to return to the church until that time the sacrament of reconciliation was typically received only once during a person's life during this time, in order to readmit into the church those who had renounced their faith, the sacrament was made more readily available, although penances were often harsh. So that would be L, liturgy, because the sacraments pertain to the liturgy of the church, the public worship, the way that the church ministers the grace of God to the people through the seven outward signs given by Jesus to the apostles. Number three, the council, One before I go on to the next question though, let me just say that many people did not renounce their faith at that time and they died for Jesus. And that that's occurring even now in our world in um, some places like Iraq where Christians are being persecuted and um, Christians are laying down their lives even now. But, but the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians was the saying of Tertullian, so, meaning that when people lay down their lives for Jesus Christ, the church flourishes because there's no greater, as Jesus said, greater love than this. No one has that a man lay down his life for his friends. 
The Council of Nicaea was held to correct the heretical teachings of Gnosticism and Arianism, which denied Christ's humanity. Gnosticism denied his humanity and Arianism denied his divinity. Divinity means his Godhead. The Council Fathers developed the Nicene Creed to state clearly that Christians believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man. So that would be doctrine. And the Nicene Creed is the creed that we profess at Mass on Sunday. And if, if you notice, if you compare it to the Apostles' Creed, and, the Nicene, and um, you see that the Nicene Creed is longer because it's specifically addressing what was being attacked at that time. And so we say God from God, light from light, speaking of Jesus Christ, because it, it's emphasizing the fact that Jesus is God. He's perfect man and he's perfect God. He has two natures. He's one person, one divine person, but he has the nature of God and the nature of man united in that one person. Number four, Emperor Theodos Theodosius ordered the killing of 7,000 people. St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, made the emperor perform several weeks of humiliating public penance, penance, saying, the emperor is in the church, not above it. So the hierarchy, uh, the moral authority of the church rises above the authority of any, of any president or any um, king on the earth because it's coming from God himself, the authority of the church. Now, that's not saying that it, it can't be wrongly used by individual bishops. So, so it's the teaching that the bishops who are in union with the Pope um, are, are, are the ones that we need. We, we need to listen to our bishop. But, but if it would happen that a bishop started teaching something that wasn't according to the, what's been handed down to us from Jesus Christ, then, then we need to not follow that particular bishop. But I mean, in most cases that doesn't occur, but, but it does sometimes happen because think about it. Um, Jesus chose 12 apostles and one of them became a very serious heretic, Judas Iscariot. So, so it still does happen even in our time, but that's why we need to pray for our bishops and priests that they will be faithful to the Lord. But what's interesting is that um, the Holy Spirit has preserved the church and the truth and will preserve the church and the truth until the end of time, despite the weakness of the hierarchy and the weakness of the individual members. St. Augustine taught that the validity of a sacrament comes from God who works in and through imperfect human beings and not the personal holiness of the minister. That's doctrine. Okay, and what's beautiful about that is... Um, that if you were attending a mass and the priest was in the state of mortal sin who was offering the mass, you would still be receiving the full benefit of that mass. That's what it means. The efficacy of the sacraments does not depend on the holiness of the minister. That's what that teaching means. All right, number six, St. Augustine taught that as a result of original sin, human beings have concupiscence or a tendency to sin. We are powerless alone to overcome this tendency and must cooperate with God's grace in order to achieve heaven. That's doctrine. You know, we can't save ourselves. We, we need a savior. We all need Jesus Christ. The Council of Chalcedon dogmatically declared that the Bishop of Rome had preeminence over all other bishops. Hierarchy. Okay, the Bishop of Rome is the Pope. St. Cyril and Methodius said Mass in the common language of Eastern Europe. Slavic in order to evangelize the people there. So liturgy and the church has, um, there's many liturgical rites in the church, which are all under the, under the one Holy Catholic church, but there's different manners of expressing that liturgical worship in the church. Pope Gregory VII established the College of Cardinals made up of bishops who would elect the new Pope by a two thirds majority vote, hierarchy. The Council of Trent standardized the prayers and rituals of the Mass, liturgy. Okay, so that's, um, as I said, some of them you might have answered a little bit differently because, because I think there's more than one right answer on some of them. So if, if you go back to, to the home page, okay, then um, the last thing in this unit, you have um, a crossword puzzle. So if you could pause it, and then do the puzzle and then come back on. I'll give you the answers to the crossword puzzle. 
Okay, so here are your answers to the church crossword puzzle. So let me read the, um, the questions and the answers. Hebrew word for an assembly or congregation. Okay, so that's one across and it's kahal. Very odd spelling since we're used to um, only using Q with U after it, but it's Q-A-H-A-L. Two across, the church is the inheritor. Now this was a hard one because um, um, I would have, I, personally I would have thought it was um, the fulfillment. That's what I would have, that's what I tried to put in my, when I was first doing this puzzle and it didn't fit. So I actually had to look this up, but inheritor meaning that what, what was given to the church in the Old Testament times through um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, all that God did to form his holy Jewish people was handed on to the Catholic Church as like a heritage. So we, we've inherited all that wealth. St. Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah, M-E-S-S-I-A-H. That means the anointed one. The Septuagint is the translation, is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's um, four across. And now the, the words going down. Um, it's hard for me to read them, sorry. Okay, the Greek word, I'm looking at six down right now. The Greek word for the assembly of people um, led to, called together by God, that would be ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. Okay, the number five down was the book where we read of God's covenant with Jacob. That's Genesis, the first book of the Bible, G-E-N-E-S-I-S. -E Today, the church offers mass for the faithful. Every week um, in every Catholic church, one of the masses is supposed to be offered for the people by, by the priests. Kahal and Ecclesia are both words that refer to the church, C-H-U-R-C-H. Okay, so that ends our first session on the Holy Catholic Church. So let's... Um, Pray thee, our Father, and think about as we say that thy kingdom come, that the church is the kingdom of Christ on earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, and God bless you all.